Hi, I'm Shadows Mist. I'm the creator and writer of Brimstone and Shifters Redux. And you can find me at shiftersonline.com, brimstone.net, and on Twitch at twitch.tv slash shadows underscore mist. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very special guest. She was on the show at least 13 or 14 years ago. Uh, it has been a long, long time since we have had this amazing, very talented and creative person to the point that the podcast is actually not even online anymore which i am bringing back by the way and we are joined by the creator of brimstone and of course shifters redux and a bunch of other things we'll touch on today joined by the ever talented marie Thierry. how are you doing today doing all right it has been so long since i've seen you it's so great to have you back on <laughs> it has been a hot minute hasn't it <laughs> A lot has changed in both of our mm -hmm. lives, obviously, for sure, too. Uh, oh, yeah. When you first were on the show, when we were first starting back in 2008, 2009, Brimstone was your main webcomic that I had found, and it was just an amazing story to read, and we had such a wonderful time talking. Mm -hmm. I'm jumping ahead of myself here, as I normally do, because I'm so <laughs> excited to talk with you today. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, I am, and my name is Marie Terry. I'm also known as Shadows Mist in the community. I have been in the webcomics community for a really long time. If you are wondering why only half of my face is working, I am suffering from a bout of Bell Palsy at the moment, so bear with me. I have two comics, uh, Shifters Redux and Rimstone. Shifters is actually the older of the two. I started that when I was in college, <laughs> way back in, uh, I think, 1997 was when I started drawing it. And it, at that time, it was called Shifters the Beast Within. After <laughs> some very scathing reviews and self-reflection uh, uh, kind of got shelved and rethought for about three years. I also lost my writer at the time, mm. so I had to learn how to write. So that took me a little bit of time. But after that, I still love the idea, and I think it's really important when you are a comic creator that you have to really love what you do and what stories you tell. And it was just a story I couldn't let go. So I kind of retooled it. I had a big roll of newspaper on my wall with sticky notes and figured out my story. And then uh, I started Shifters Redux uh, doing kind of a one woman show. Uh, all the writing, all the drawing, all the coloring and everything to start with. And that was about 2016, I think, that I rebooted it. And since then, I have been slowly plucking away on it as my health and my... Uh, schedule and everything has, has a thing. I'm actually, as a, as a day job, I still have a day job. Unfortunately, this is not my day job, is, is a graphic designer. So I'm still doing that and doing this. So <laughs> I also started up Brimstone uh, somewhat after that. And it's actually based on a, a role-playing campaign, like a tabletop campaign nice. that I played with a healthy dose of anime fandom in there. <laughs> So that was, that was a comic I started kind of, that was a fun, a much more fun, just kind of doing something different kind of comic to kind of give me some relief when Shifters was too much, but it kind of took on a little bit of a life of its own. So I was actually really quite surprised about that. That said, I'm also just, you know, I'm an illustrator as well as a, and I have some IMDB credits to my name as I've illustrated some role-playing books and, uh, you know, I've, I've got some credits for those. So, and I, I do private illustration and stuff too. So, and a lot of merch. A lot of merch. That's, that's just part of my my talent set as a graphic designer. The lifeblood of any creative person. You have to have that, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, you do. Uh, eventually, I'll probably have a t-shirt or something like that. I'll bring that back, you know, dust it off. But, you know. I mean, uh, if you ever if you ever want a little advice, if you ever want a little help, let me know. Sure. I'll, 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 I was very tempted. I actually, I was very tempted to break out the old t-shirt from back when I did uh, the comic circuit, uh, mm -hmm. 2012 and just showcase, you know, what it was, you know, something I quickly did on it, uh, Vista print. And it's like, all right, this is enough for promotion. We'll go from here. What's the genre of both brimstone and uh, shifters? Shifters would be probably it's cyberpunk urban horror, I'd mm -hmm. say, and fantasy, high fantasy. Uh, is definitely Brimstone's uh, genre. So those are those are two of my favorite genres. Not you know, <laughs> consequently or like coincidentally, the two of them. I, I really like uh, urban horror, but I also really like cyberpunk. So I decided to just smash them together. <laughs> 
So then what's the most misunderstood aspect about the cyberpunk urban horror genre that maybe people who don't follow them misunderstand? Well, in my case in particular, I think a lot of people don't see the cyberpunk aspect as much. It's kind of hard now because a lot of our technology is catching up as like daily life to what was once cyberpunk, especially like back in the 80s and 90s. You know, you look at Neuromats or you look at some of those influences. And you look at even like Cyberpunk 2077, which came out and stuff. And it's like, you can recognize a lot of the tangents that are going there. Like this is all just beside like things like cybernetics, which we don't yet really have, but even then we kind of do in some ways, or at least we're going in that direction. I think it's like you lose some of the actual futuristic aspects of it, unless you like really push it into almost beyond where I think cyberpunk lies in its sweet spot. I do have to remind people a lot of the time that shifters actually is an alternate timeline to earth because the reason for the mega cities and everything like that is that there was a war a nuclear exchange that happened at a certain point it didn't go into like it was kind of like one of those like oh cat sorry cat but <laughs> there was a nuclear exchange in the story that rendered a good fort part of north america uninhabitable which forced everybody onto the coasts like it was a central North America strike. And so a lot of people had to go to the coast. So that's why they built the mega cities when they did. It was because there was refugees and they needed somewhere to live. And it ended up kind of changing the trajectory of that world's history. So in order to actually have the cyberpunk I wanted for my story, I had to alter the world's history somewhat. But it's actually kind of worked out in my favor. I enjoy history. I love reading like I, I read recreationally I read a lot of history stuff it's fun for me that way and it keeps me interested in the story I love history for me it was I got into kind of a history buff with uh, Age of Empires when I was playing those games back mm -hmm. in the day and Age of Empires 2 and it got to the point where I was creating campaigns uh, in the game engine itself and it was just so much fun just mm -hmm. to kind of see how how you can take a, either a comic or a video game and, and use history for telling amazing stories such as, as that. It was, it's great to see. And I, I just love it. It's definitely uh, something that I really enjoy. I love role-playing. Uh, so I, I love tabletop. I love role-playing. One of the things that like I enjoy is writing settings for role-playing. And actually, Shifter started out as a role-playing setting. Oh, yeah. for my tabletop buddies at the time when I was in college. So I was like, oh, this is something I want to play in. And... I didn't know really about werewolves' existence at the time, but also, like, I didn't want to necessarily play in modern day. I was really big into Cyberpunk 2020 by R. Telesaurian. Yeah. So I was like, I want to play, I want to play vampires and werewolves in this world. I don't want to play in modern day. So I made myself a setting that I liked and I could play with other people. I created a system and I created, you know, all the, the stuff that goes with it. And, and I was like, this would be a really fun comic to write, or a really fun place to write a comic in a really fun setting. So that's also where that kind of came in, was the mm -hmm. cyberpunk influences from tabletop and also like uh, just science fiction in general. Like I enjoy science fiction. I'm a big science fi science fiction buff. I'm, my husband is too. And we are always immersed in that world. So it's really fun to write in it as well. That's amazing. And especially to have such a supportive, you know, husband mm -hmm. <laughs> that also lets your interest too. It's, it's a win-win, yeah. right? <laughs> it is totally. It's great. He's so That's supportive. Fun. How long have you been together? 23 years now, I think. Longer yeah. than some campaigns? <laughs> yeah, long, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we actually met in high school originally. We went through tabletop. The guy was running the tabletop club and he joined and a year later we were dating. <laughs> You know, looking at yourself and your creative journey that you've been doing with not only these comics, but other things as well that we'll touch on here too, like uh, the cons and stuff, and yeah, the cons and all that other stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you expect your creative journey to take as many tangents as it has? Um, you know, I don't think I've ever seen my creative journey as a line. Uh, I've always seen it as a wandering path where, that I go where I want. I'm like a cat. I just kind of go where I want. So I definitely think I didn't expect this many roadblocks is more is less about tangents and more about roadblocks because I have not always been in the best of health. Unfortunately, I'm not a, a person, unfortunately, who enjoys <laughs> as currently noted with half of my face not working. You know, I, I end up with uh, interesting 
diseases and health problems. So I, I don't think I ever expected to be continue like to have a, to, to things to take this long. I mean, it doesn't help that I did, you know, just kind of toss like 400 pages aside and say, oh, okay, I'm going to start again, you know, <laughs> somebody who's crazy. I think every time though, that I am working every time I put pen to paper, it is a learning experience. Like it's constantly learning. It's constantly exploring. It's constantly challenging yourself. Like it matters, but it doesn't necessarily matter at the same time. It kind of is, it's fine to wander. Like, you know, you know, like they say, you know, those who, who wander not necessarily lost. And I think that that's, that's just sort of how I view my creative journey. And, and I'm just taking people along with me. I hope people enjoy that. <laughs> well, I, I think they have. I don't think you would have kept doing it if, if you felt that, you know, you were stuck in a process or stuck in, in a thing. You've always evolved yourself creatively, mm -hmm. graphically as well, too. And you completely retold your entire comic as well. Like that takes guts to be, to be perfectly <laughs> fair. You could have just left it as is and just continued on with the story, but you saw a better way to do it. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't happy with it. Like at the time, I wasn't happy with the direction. I wasn't happy with how it was flowing. I was too, I was just too agitated by when I go back and I read one of my stories, I want to feel good about reading it. I want to feel excited about reading it. It's got to have a flow. And I went back and I read it critically and I realized how, it, especially in the early days when I really didn't know what I was doing, it really didn't. So I'm like, no. If I want to continue this, I have to go back to the beginning. I can't continue it for where I am. I've written myself into a corner. It's kind of like, no, no, go back to start. You've <laughs> you've found a dead end. You you do not pesco. You do not collect two hundred dollars. You get to go back to start. <laughs> and so that was kind of how that went. And you know what? I'm actually really glad that I have because it's definitely turning more into the story I wanted to tell. As much as I I adore my writer at the time, who is James Strassel. We definitely had some different ideas, and I didn't really realize it until later. I was way too focused on learning the artistic aspect of cartooning as opposed to being able to creatively direct a writer who has very different ideas than you. You have to be the producer and the director for everything mm -hmm. that you're doing, whether it's a, a film or a comic or whatever, because no one, and this is 20 years of IT speaking as well, we're not mind readers. We, we don't know what's happening. So you, no. know, you just got to talk it out. <laughs> and, and I mean, now, obviously, I'm in a point in my career where I've, direct, I've now directed many creatives. I have the experience of being a senior designer in a management position. I've had managerial experience experience now directing people in large capacities, creative capacities to all work in the same page, working with the cons and stuff. And we can get into that later has definitely helped me develop those skills. Communication is always very difficult too, especially when you have conflicting visions as well too, mm -hmm. and, and especially creative visions at that, because it's like hurting cats basically. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is difficult. And, and it's also like, you know, creatives are people who they have their own vision and they have their own ideas and you have to respect that about them. But at the same time, you have to let them not get too far, so far off the script that it goes sideways. And sometimes that requires a, a gentle hand and sometimes it requires a little bit more he heavy handed depending on what's going on. But it is definitely a challenge to find that balance. So I was take away their power cord for their tablet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not usually like, I don't like using the stick creatively that much. I, I feel like that demoralizes an artist and that includes writers and other creatives like that. I like to see how we can find a way to work forward that we're both happy with so that we're not demoralized when we actually come to the point of doing the work. Creativity is a hard thing to do anyway, especially on demand, especially when you aren't working necessarily with the material you're most familiar with, or, you know, you're still kind of in a learning process, or maybe you're not a professional at it. You know, you're a, just kind of a skilled amateur. You need to have, as, an, as a manager type, you need to have certain skills to develop not only the product, but their creativity, their skill, and not demoralize them in the process, like not make them feel like, like crap, basically, because they've made a mistake or maybe their vision doesn't match the needs of the project. You have to kind of find a way to align visions without hurting feelings. The convention scene, at least from, from my side of things, is interviewing people is completely different than being behind a table, obviously. <laughs> behind the scenes as a con runner. And that's what I've been doing a lot of. 
I've actually been one of those people that makes the con happen nice. and makes it go. In my case, I've been doing communications mostly and doing, making sure that all of the signage and all of the decorations and all of the stories, you know, all of the social media and all that happens. But I've also been uh, a chair, which means I just made everything go. <laughs> Uh, making sure all the people are doing all their jobs on time in order to make sure that an event happens. Event planning is very hard. I will just say that. Very hard, very thankless. I mean, obviously, I spent many years behind a, a table for and I and a, as a vendor, and it's something I still incredibly enjoy when I get to go and, and vend and meet people and meet fans. And it's an absolutely thrilling experience, and I love it. And that's why I've, I've done it for like the past decade. <laughs> I've been everywhere from San Diego Comic Con to my local Comic Con to my local furry con to my local anime con. So I've been all over the place and I've tried all the different genres. I actually got involved running cons. I think it was 2012 is when I first started getting involved. And that was like doing like their con book. Cause as a graphic designer, it's easy for me to do that kind of work. Um, doing signage, making t-shirts, that kind of thing, con merch, whatever. That was with Cost and Effect was the one I started with, which is a local con that doesn't exist anymore. Um, that was run by uh, a friend of mine, Greg Neher. He kind of merged, like there was kind of a, a disruption on the scene in Vancouver, which is where I am, where the local anime con uh, ran into some financial trouble. Oh, wow. So they weren't able to run for like a, a year, a couple of years. Uh, another con set up in its place and it kind of stole their name at first. Um, anyway, there was a bit of drama there. And then they kind of, there was three cons that decided to team up and do like one big con, like three cons under one roof. And that was where I really started to get involved as uh you know, like in a, in a bigger way. I mean, I, I did do the vending, uh, the vendors for, for one con for anime con. And I don't think I would ever do that again, just because I did not enjoy the policing aspect of it in the terms of in this particular con, they did not allow bootleg merch, especially of anything Studio Ghibli or Disney just for copyright reasons. And, you know, looking to avoid any kind of, uh, back legal backlash basically, but I didn't, I didn't, didn't enjoy that as much. So like communications is definitely more my jam, but I got into the other one to, again, to help the graphic design, to help with communications, to help. And it was a good experience, but it was also a very tough experience. It was really interesting jumping from that experience into furry cons because that's where i i got i started to get involved with my local furry con which is vancouver the difference in terms of the people was really stark i have to say that i really enjoy working with the furry community they're so passionate about what they do and they're so kind and it's a lot easier to work with everybody kind of all rowing in the same direction and with so much passion and kindness and it, it not only like amazing skill sets to work with it's insane the skill sets that you get to work with and the people you get to work with and how great they are and how they can just bring it like knock it out of the park even when all the chips are down it is absolutely amazing how they pull together absolutely just just blown away and that's why i continue to work with them because i just i don't want to lose that special group that I, I am a part of that both needs me and I need them, you know, like it's absolutely a phenomenal experience. Uh, and I definitely would encourage people to, to try it out if, if they do have a local con, especially a furry con to volunteer for their local convention, help out. And not only are you going to get really valuable experience, but you know, you're going to connect with the group of people that are going to just blow your mind. <laughs> What type of skill sets have you seen at Vancouver that can translate to real life? I worked very closely with a journalism person because while I am a graphic designer, I am not the best journalist in the world. And this person is near and dear to my heart. They have saved my butt so many times as a journalist and they parlayed that, you know, those skills and stuff into a job. Same with social media management. We also have like uh, hotel liaison, uh, other people have 
parlayed their skills into jobs. Our IT people have parlayed their things into jobs. Many of the people who operate our AV stages already are actually professional AV people. They're coming in from the industry and they're running stuff or they're learning to run stuff and getting jobs in the AV industry. I mean, because we work with professional equipment. We put on concerts and shows and contests and like the dances. Oh my God, par furries know how to party. Holy macaroni. S security is another one doing customer liaison programming um even event catering event management so much like there's like literally every job could translate into a job in real life part of my job where i work is in events so i have had like almost a decade worth of events experience and even that having that under my belt before i became a chair it was amazing like it was good because i i had i, I kind of knew what i was walking into but i still learned like so much and i'm still learning so much about all kinds of things like it is a never ending learning experience if you let it be yeah, that's funny because i've i've always wanted to start a twitch channel myself and i kind of have one but i think my uh my Gaming days are a little more rage filled sometimes. It seems I got to find some cozy games or something to calm me down, you know, when I'm playing. I mean, there's the most popular category on Twitch is just talking. Hmm. Just talking. Really? So, I mean, you could do a, a sort of interactive segment of this on Twitch of just talking. I may have to try that. It's uh, something I had to jump into. Um, definitely. Because I have the ability to with the there's setup. a lovely uh, feature they've added called guest host so that you can have live other Twitch streamers if you want to kind of do a little bit more of that kind of thing. Taking two, ge two geeks talking to Twitch. That'd be well, I, I mean, it's an option because you do have the ability at that point to um, if you use something like their stream software that lets you stream to multiple platforms at once and you wouldn't mm -hmm. have to deal with this 15 minute time limit thing. Yeah, it's just, it's an option if that's something that you, you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And the guest host uh, thing lets other people join and, and spread. The nice thing I think about Twitch is the networking. A lot of that is cool. And I can talk more to you about that after this, if you like. Yeah, no, that'd be, that'd be awesome for sure. Mm -hmm. I definitely uh, would love to do that because that's, that's how I happened upon uh, your channel actually. Yeah. It was just because I was. <laughs> I was just streaming through the the thing. I think I was looking at some Destiny 2 stuff and I saw Shadow Mist. That sounds like a familiar name. I yep. haven't seen that in forever. <laughs> and you just happened to be there. <laughs> it was a great, it was, it was like definitely kismet right there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that because, you know, mm -hmm. being, being a streamer and having fun with games is always good, a way mm -hmm. to relax, but also connect like we just talked about here. Well, I also too. draw on there too. Like I, I draw live, so. Nice. So. So how did you get into to Twitch then? And, and what do you enjoy about it? Um, oh, well, okay. So, I mean, so this is going to take a little bit of a tangent, but the web comics world has changed a lot in the last, like, you know, decade, a little more, not two decades that I've been in it. And it's kind of almost frightening to say like, oh my God, I've been in this industry for 20 years. Oh my God. <laughs> um, it's been very, uh, very different. And I was looking for like, especially with Twitter kind of tanking as it has been, I've been really looking for somewhere else to, I guess, do more live interactive type stuff, branch out as a, as a sort of more of a personality as well, so that I can draw some attention to my work outside of, you know, the Twitters and the Facebooks of the world, like so find other audience that I could engage in real time. I used to do streaming with my comics when I was drawing them. And it, one of the things that it does is it keeps me on track and it sets me a regular schedule, which is something that I desperately need <laughs> uh, to stay on track with updates and stuff. I really, really need to have that regular time put aside that people expect me to be somewhere. And I thought, okay, you know, everybody's on Twitch. It's free. I'm going to try it out. It's it's only OBS. I can use OBS, which is free, or Streamlabs or whatever. And I can just, you know, see how this thing works. And you know, a lot of other people were into it. Um, this is especially, uh, you know, during the pandemic and stuff where it was kind of like everybody was kind of trying to find new ways to connect with people. And I just sort of just started doing it, like kind of like I used to in the sense of like streaming. But I also decided, you know what, I'm going to try playing some video games on, you know, and it allows me to change my category so that I'm 
sort of in theme for that particular day or whatever and do that and I also had a friend who was kind of hounding me about VTubing about VTubers I should say at the time wasn't asking me to VTube but it was but was saying like oh you have a great voice you'd be a great VTuber blah 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 so I was like okay I'll check it out so I checked it out and I was like okay this is really cute first off and then I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to give it a try. I'm just going to like see what happens. Like uh, I, I got a friend of mine to be a moderator and I started a two day a week thing. Cause that's all I felt that I, at the time that I could essentially upkeep was two days a week, basically Monday. And I was working from home at the time, which was probably the only reason that I could actually pull this off. <laughs> I started just playing an old favorite of mine, a uh, game, retro game, uh, which was City of Heroes. Nice. And so I played Certain of Heroes and I was playing Elder Scrolls online and then I, I was drawing. So I would I would do a day where I would just draw either commissions that I had or uh, drawing comics. So I would just do that on stream and connect with Shifters fans. Not long after I started doing it pretty regularly for a couple of months, I started to see regular people hanging out, like regular fans coming back and saying, hey, oh, hey, oh my god, I haven't seen this forever. You know, people who also played uh, City of Heroes for, like forever ago. Yeah. And it's like, there you go, <laughs> you know? And I started reconnecting with that community that I had been a part of a long time ago before the game shut down originally, because I played it back in the day when you had to pay for it i was just reveling in the nostalgia and the the thing and then i started i reconnected with mike prokop uh, who you know yeah. we'd always played city of heroes back in the day together and it was just kind of a, a time that we had always shared and we thought oh you know like let's do this on twitch and just kind of do it for funsies and see what happens and it's become kind of a regular staple of both of our programming to do our collab where we stream city of heroes and just you know mostly just part about we're not like pro players or anything we're not going to be telling you how to make your best build or whatever you're going to be mostly watching us face plant and try to take out more than we can chew <laughs> uh, and talk about random things so we're talking while we're playing so you know like we, we have conversations and whatnot i've got a little vtuber avatar that i use now that i've made that i use on the side especially when i can't be on camera like right now like i'm making a bit of an exception right now on twitch i'm pretty much using my vtuber avatar just because this is kind of disturbing to watch 24 7 except with the cat cam when the cat, ca I put the cat cam on. Like you, you get, you get quality cat content on my channel because I have two very lovely cats that like to make regular appearances. You can also feed them, give them treats through my channel, <laughs> so you can actually feed my cats. And people like that. People like to interact with fuzzy animals that they they wouldn't otherwise have a chance to get them up to the the thing, and they're like you know all over on my desk, whatever, and I give them treats for people and yeah. It's been a lot of fun and it has actually kind of worked the way I wanted it to. It has brought attention back to shifters, uh anticipation back to shifters. Right now I'm obviously I'm going through a bit of a bad patch. I'm not able to update as much as I want, but I did get a chance to redo my website for shifters, which makes it much faster. I'm still working out a few kinks. Um, my uh, SSH or SSL certificate or whatever isn't working properly the way it should. So I got to figure out what's wrong. On a whole, even if you, if you go to shiftersonline.com right now, you should be able to see the new site. There are starting to be new pages posted publicly. They've been on my Patreon for a little while, but I'm only just starting to, to post them online now, like for public consumption. Yeah, that, that's something that I've been toying with and I'll, I'll, I'll be doing eventually. It's just trying to... Uh, bring back the old podcast because I have at least, gosh, 12, 13 years of shows that I haven't seen the light of day recently. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's definitely something you can do. Uh, you can run reruns essentially on Twitch. Uh, you just have to indicate you're running a rerun. So, I mean, you could maybe something old is new again. You know, yeah, well, content well, is content, right? I, st I still have, I think our, our old interview was like two hours or something like that <laughs> right? in, in audio format. That's not edited. It's completely raw. So like, oh, wow. yeah, there, there's, uh, there's a lot of really great content back in the day, but I, I always wonder if the climate is right for some of the older content, you know, it's, it's oh, that's, that's definitely, you know, that's definitely a thing is when you've been working in a medium for a really long time and the times have changed you can definitely run into interesting takes on your work I, I was tooling around twitter and i found out that i was banned by a certain fairly large webcomic news affiliate yeah. site it, and i did i wasn't up until a certain point and i have a feeling that it might have had to do with something that happened in my comic and they were mad about it 
It's a little drastic, don't you think? A little. I think maybe it was a little. I would have rather had a conversation about it before they decided to just block me for no apparent reason. Not that it's not easy as heck to get around a van if you really want to. All I have to do is log out and look at your tweet. But it, it was it was kind of a bit of a aha moment for me because I was like, you know, like I've done a thing in my comic, yes, but you don't know how it's going to pan out. But you're punishing me for some for storytelling essentially and it's like i and yeah okay yes the person who was affected was a person of color at the time but like you don't know that he's you know that, that this is the way it looks this person is also kind of a bad guy so and that was kind of evident from the start like bad guys have bad things happen to them in comics that's just kind of the way it works i don't know but it's like you know the, the big i think a bigger conversation of like i mean you, you're obviously free to do what you want to do and if something makes you uncomfortable don't consume that media whatever you know like i've kind of you know for the most part i've, I've moved on from that obviously and the occasional time when people inevitably link to this site to show me something new comic news related i you know, have to go through hoops to, to read what it is that my friends wanted to tell me. But, you know, there are, I guess, consequences to making story decisions. And I'm not necessarily going to apologize for my story decisions, especially in the moment, because I didn't think there was going to be a huge issue because I know what's going to happen. I know you don't know necessarily what's going to happen, but like, I also kind of look at the world and I I guess I personally, I'm, I hold a mirror up to it and basically this is what I see to some degree is like, you know, yeah, sure, the white people haven't had necessarily the bad things happen to them that are supposed to happen to them yet because they're main characters. I'm going to torture them. It's going to happen. And the end probably isn't going to be what you expect. But judging me based on an unfinished work I feel is kind of a bit premature, it's if like that makes sense. It's as if you get a series from, say, like George R. R. Martin or Stephen King or something, or Neil Gaiman, let's say, and he stops halfway through and you're expecting something or you have a twist on a character you're fully invested in, and then it's like nothing happens or, or you decide to not pick up the book because that pissed you off. It's like, well, what about the rest of the story? What about everything else? Then? Yeah. It's like, if everything just stops like halfway through the red wedding, what, what is your thoughts there? You know, like, you know, it's, it's bad catering is what it was. It yeah. Was... It, it's just like, I have a regular day job. I, and you know, shifters does not pay my bills. I put out money for it. I put out time for it. I mean, it is a labor of love. And right now, I'm handling a lot of the coloring and stuff too, which I'm very slow at. It takes me probably almost a month to produce a page right now, just in the amount of time that I have to work on it. And I can't even really work on it right now because of the muscle weakness and problems I'm having with my face and the medications I'm taking to deal with this right now and the pain that I'm dealing with right now. Because let me tell you, Bill's palsy is ouch when I run into these things, it slow, you know, it always slows me down. Now there's, there's, there's definitely considerations I've had in the sense of like, I'm getting on in life. I would like to finish this before I die. I've thought about writing it as a novel because that might be actually faster just because it's less like the drawing takes less time. <laughs> like the, the, it takes less time to write than it does to actually draw a comic. But yeah, it, it just takes a lot of time to do comics. And whereas like, you know, writing a novel, if I put time into it, uh, and the same kind of time into it would yield progress a lot faster. I mean, I might still, being a product of an older generation, uh, I am not necessarily as aware of sensibilities, especially online, maybe uh, in certain spheres, as maybe uh, younger people might be. But at the same time, I don't want to compromise the stories that I want to tell in the sense of like, maybe I don't want to change them significantly based on making people uncomfortable. I think that art does have a role in making people a little uncomfortable and maybe having different takes on a, a view of society necessarily. Like I'm not, I'm not saying obviously that we shouldn't be respectful to each other but it is long been the role of the artist to kind of offend people in some ways and have them explore those feelings a little bit especially through things like stories and fables and things is like you don't necessarily know what 
is going to happen and it is up to you how you react to it. Um, but part of art is to make you think. If I have made you think or made you feel, that is part of my job as an artist. It's one thing to spread hate per se. It's another thing to show, show somebody's life and the hardships that they've endured and having those hardships happen to them and having people around them react realistically. There's actually a scene coming up in Shifters I have been kind of agonizing over because of sort of some of that influence, honestly. Trying to figure out, like, my original idea for that scene, I don't really think is going to fly in today's, you know, day and age. So I have to, I had to rethink that scene several times over in order to try to kind of figure out, okay, what, well, what makes the scene the most palatable it can be? I want to represent a slice of everyday people. And the place where I live, Vancouver, is very diverse. It is a very diverse place. There's a lot of people here of color and of different ethnicities. And I'm sorry, but bad things happen to good people. And bad things happen to everybody so i try to be an equal opportunity writer in the sense that bad things happen to all of the characters it's just there's a bias sometimes i think when people look at a work that they're seeing it from their perspective as being like oh this was a character that i thought was cool and bad things are happening to them and i don't like that well I hate to break it to you, but it's a story. And if bad things don't happen, then the characters can't grow. So, and you'll get, and you'll get bored as well, too. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes characters need to die. And I'm sorry if it was your favorite character, but the character needs to die for the arc to continue. Like, that is, you love to side character. I'm sorry that was your problem. I don't know. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, I, you know, and the other thing is, it's like, I, I'm sorry, but I'm a white person. I am going to be inherently biased into my you know my thing and yes i have people who are diverse friends especially thanks to the furry community i do you know come into a contact with a lot more diverse people and hang out with a lot more diverse people and through my work I, I deal a lot with indigenous folk and you know and other again more people of color and i try to listen to them and i try to understand them but i'm never going to be them so as much as i've like I can't take you know somebody else's brain and put it in mine and to, in order to write things necessarily authentically I'm still going to write from my point of view and I'm, I'm going to try to be respectful but still like I said bad things happen to good people yeah. and I'm sorry that it happened to be that person at that time but I, pl I, I plan to do plenty of evil things to you know white people too believe me this is not a gentle story you know like oftentimes there, there's actually some character choices I have made that one of the things I really enjoy with writing things like shifters is the morality is super gray mm -hmm. and you never quite know who's actually the bad guy and who's actually the good guy and I haven't really gotten into a lot of that yet because um, Shifters isn't really that far along, at least Redux isn't. It's only like four chapters in. Like you can't really see the character of a story's writing in the first four chapters. And if you're so ticked off that you're going to ban the author because in the first four chapters something happened you didn't like, I don't know if that says more about me or something about you. I mean, if you stopped reading anything from Marvel or DC in a, in an arc or whatever that was more popular, say like a Chris Claremont, like X Men or whatever, mm -hmm. and you stop the Phoenix Saga, you know, at four four issues into its arc, what's the difference between that and and a stopping reading a, a comic that is online that you created four mm -hmm. chapters in? You're limiting yourself and your your point of view because of a character interaction and. The same can be said when you're reading a book as well. If you stop four chapters into, say, Tolstoy or something like that, you're not going to get the full picture. There's, it's awkward. It's, it's, it's awkward. And it's, you know, I guess it's a unique experience in the respect that, like, online, we can write stories that end up stalled in chapter four. And it can take five years to get there. Because, you know, we're not professionals. We're not doing it the way that pros would do it in the sense of we're, you know, have a team and we're all working from the script. The script's been vetted multiple times, you know, like and we have all these different people with all these different specialties. Hi, cat. Um, <laughs> cat butt. This is the butt. This is what I this is This is my quality cat content. I promise this on all streams I'm on. You get some free quality cat content. This is Max. 
Max. He's, he's my boy. And he, apparently he really wants treats right now. This is <laughs> why he's bugging me. He's like, meowing in the really, background. Yeah. <laughs> give me just a hot second here. That's all right. Take I'm just going to give him some treats so that he's uh, a little bit more chill. There is your audio. There we go. Max just, got Max got Max got his treats. He's happy okay. now. So hopefully he'll leave us alone for another 10 minutes. That's all right. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, I would probably say most of the Marvel mix guys. I think it's, uh, I had a book uh, I found in the library uh, when I was in high school, and it was called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. And I think it's Stan Lee and John Buscema, I think. And I'd say that book was instrumental in me getting into drawing comics in general and then uh Rumiko Takahashi was like my absolute favorite um mangaka for the longest time uh, I was just really into Ranma one half and when I was younger and that was another that was like an opening into a world because I am a huge anime fan uh I love anime and I think that was like one of the very first series that I really like I collected all of the comics all of the graphic novels and I drew so much Radma fan art when I was young <laughs> so I have to say that probably those were my biggest influences uh for comics where I got into that but obviously uh tabletop gaming in general and you know has been a huge thing and my family my family's very artistic. Uh, my grand, both my grandfathers were oil painters. My father was an oil painter and a photographer, and uh, and he was actually a cartoonist. He he did a lot of little cartoons. They're never published or anything, but he was constantly drawing little cartoons. And he was the one who taught me draw from life, like find things in life that inspire you, and and use those things and. I started actually drawing comics with a cat, with a cat, with my little cat that I had at the time named Tinker. And I started doing these just four page comics and started a lot like Garfield type comics. And I just, I just drew these for years uh, when I was in elementary school. And that was sort of part of my, I guess, uh, entry into comics. And it's just evolved, really. You wouldn't mm. guess it from looking at my work now, but yes, Gar <laughs> there was some Garfield in there. <laughs> for me, it was, uh, Farside was, was in that that realm as well as Calvin and Hobbes and Garfield and, and, and I mean and I, I was like 11 so and it was back in the 80s so yeah. good times uh simpler times back then yeah from a professional standpoint you are a multi-talented person not only a con organizer but graphic designer comic creator and many other avenue and TTRPG player as well, and many other things we haven't touched upon mm -hmm. this time around, which means, you know, hopefully not 15 years later, we'll have you back on, obviously, and <laughs> talk more about your amazing mm -hmm. talent and career. So professionally, you're successful in, in many different regards. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I would say yes, I do. I can also consider myself a hella lucky. There are definitely points in my career that if things hadn't gone a certain way that I don't think that I would be where I am right now. I have been blessed to be surrounded by supportive people and people who have encouraged me, people who have helped me directly or indirectly. I have learned from so many people that I still learn from today. Uh, I don't think that you are ever like you ever stop learning. I mean, that's probably not just not just from me working in higher education. You kind of have to keep pushing yourself. You have to kind of keep learning. And I, I well, I think I am, I am successful in the sense that I have a home. I have a, uh, you know, I have a roof over my head. I have two cats. I have a wonderful husband. I have a car. My life, I don't, you know, worry too much about eating day to day right now. Um, I mean, yes, it, things are tight as it was with everybody, but I still have all these blessings. And these were things that were tedious or tenuous. And it's not tedious so much as tenuous. When I was younger, my family was very poor. We didn't know if we were going to eat day to day. Uh, we had a house that was 
falling apart, literally. You know, I don't have vermin in my house. I have a lot of privilege. And I think that that is part of that success. As a result of that, I, I really am trying to use my more stable base to essentially pull others up. I have had people stay with me who have no, had nowhere else to go, um, especially trans youth. I have trained more than one person how to adult or how to drive a car, you know, just to help them get on their feet uh, so that they could get a job or, you know, they could move forward in their life. I kind of think that, you know, like if if you have the ability to help, you should. And I try to practice that. Uh, I tried to give back uh, for all of those who gave to me to get me to this point so that I could live a life as, you know, relatively uh, comfortable as this one is right now. I mean, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination. I own a townhouse in Vancouver. I am not rich. <laughs> but a lot of people would see me as that way because I own something. So, but I mean, I got into the housing market before it went ballistic because i'm old yeah so but again i recognize that luck that privilege that i had the opportunity to do that before it got to this point and not you know and the people today don't have that opportunity so again a lot of luck but you know i, I did work hard for what i what i do have and there isn't many other places unless I want to go to central Canada and I don't know what I would do there. So I have a very comfortable job here and I have a job that I'm good at and the people I work with, I love. They are so wonderful and supportive and amazing people that like a lot of people can't say that about their work. A lot of people go to work every day and they hate it. I have the, I have the privilege and the fortune that I can go to every day to work every day and love everybody who I work with and what I do. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, well, I kind of said a little bit before that, like everything I that happens to me is a learning experience, and I don't actually look at failure as failure. I always see there as an opportunity to learn, as something like, okay, I obviously have done this thing and I have made a mistake, but that doesn't mean I have failed yet. Um, and that's kind of a lot of how I look at it is like, I'm going to correct the mistake or I'm going to try again and I'm going to, you know, do better this time. I'm going to learn from what I did last. I'm going to take really, really careful notes of what I, what I did that didn't work. And that's more like what I, I think of it as. I don't think of it as failure. I think is what did I do that didn't work? Um, and I don't, I'm trying, you know, like I try to think of something where I, I think that I, I failed utterly. And the only thing that I, like, I can kind of think of is like, I didn't, and, and every time I go back and really examine my failures or what might be considered failures would be like, they don't feel like a failure exactly. More like a, I did some things right, but there's obviously some things I didn't know at the time or I didn't have enough knowledge in this area and it fell down or... I mean, maybe it's a product of learning to critique design of like, you're not there yet. Um, or what is, is, it's like a thing actually it was what I learned in school, but it, it was what my teacher said all the time was like, you're not there yet. You're onto something, but you're not there yet. You need to keep trying. And I am a stubborn creature. So I just keep trying and I keep learning from my, from my mistakes. And I'd, I'd rather say that they are mistakes than failures because you could fix a mistake and most of the time, like, you can, like, there's, if you're thinking about it, you can learn from what you've done wrong. And I mean, like, if we were all here, all perfect, all the time, it wouldn't be life. We're here to fail sometimes. We're here to make mistakes. We're here to, you know, and sometimes fail spectacularly. And sometimes failures happen that aren't even your fault. And you have to cut yourself slack to say, okay, you know what? The universe just decided this was not going to be a thing today. And... Uh, I'm going to just take the L and I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to do something else until I can come back to this other thing and maybe make it a win. Uh, and maybe I needed to learn this thing to make it a win. I don't see failure as failure in like a, as like a negative thing per se. I see it as an opportunity to learn. I see it as an opportunity to recognize what I ha could have done differently 
or what I need to do differently to make it a win. That's sort of how I treat, uh, you know, how I go through it. And, you know, and I, when you <laughs> doing event organization has taught me a lot about that and, and a lot about learning from what might look like a disaster on the outside uh, and turning it into something that is actually very positive. And I like that is sort of like one of my mantras in life is that I don't see any experience as a a bad thing. I mean, it might suck while you're do while you're going through it, sure, but it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you're going to learn from it, as long as you can analyze it and sort of see what happened there, and you can and you can fix something in the future because you've learned something from the past. I think the biggest like the biggest failure would be not to examine and not to learn from what you didn't try keep trying to do the same thing over and over and over again with the same mistakes essentially definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results yeah exactly and it's like it i mean it could produce different results based on the, the environment but maybe it's that's the thing you got to change is maybe the environment is bad for a certain idea or a certain concept or whatever i mean there's also just some truths you have to accept. For example, um, uh, brimstone and shifters. Like shifters is never going to be quite as popular as brimstone because it's just not the genre that people really often connect with easily. People find fantasy a lot more easy to uh, sort of hand wave, get it, just kind of dump your brain at the door a little bit and just enjoy. Uh, science fiction is a genre that people like to pick apart people have to kind of um be into certain things to kind of really enjoy science fiction as a genre and it's not as 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 many people who enjoy it as fantasy so you're going to just you're going to find some things that some people might take that as a as a as a bad thing i don't take it as a bad thing i just simply realize the demographics of who likes what you know, like, it's not a bad thing. And it doesn't mean that this is an inherently a bad comic. It just means that this story doesn't appeal on the surface to um, a lot of people. It, it was always kind of a niche interest to begin with. And I just accept that. And in that, in that respect, the fact that I still have these hardcore people that are, like, you know, with me and have been with me for so long and become my friends, like some of them are like very dear friends at this point. It had me, it gave me the opportunity to meet these great people and have them in my life. That is not a loss. That is not, that is not a, a fail. You know, like maybe if it was my, my absolute, uh, you know, my goal in life to be like the most popular web comic artist in the world. Okay. Maybe I failed at that, but you know what, maybe that wasn't a goal that was worth having. You know, like, <laughs> I don't think that that's why I ever started writing stories. And stuff. I just want to share what my stories were with people that, like me, liked this stuff. I found those people, and I consider that a win. We're here for a short time, not a long time, something like that. <laughs> We're here for a good time. <laughs> but yeah, that too. I mean, just Not a long time. Yeah, right. I knew it was one of those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Canadianisms. Uh, yeah. Gotta love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The younger generation is looking at your work and yourself as an inspiring person, and maybe you've inspired them on their path to creativity, whether it's as a con organizer or a comic creator, or as you have been mentoring the young generation as well, too, mm -hmm. with your own experiences. You've, you kind of have that all encompassing aspect of already inspiring the younger generation as it is. Yeah, I try. Uh, I have nieces, man. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think it's it's very similar to the way that we've inspired them is they they need to find their voice. They need to learn to be compassionate. They need to learn to be kind to each other. Some of today's youth, I think, need to just like loosen up a little bit and live and not worry so much about things like labels and you know, just let let kind of things be a little bit. Learn to learn to chill out, maybe, I would say. Is like chill, please have some chill. Life is not as serious as you think it is when you're younger. You learn as you get older. Uh, you only have so many kind of Fs to give in in a certain quantity at any given time. And I feel like when you're young, you have way more than you probably should. Uh, and as you get older, you find that, that stockpile dwindling. And you learn that, you know what? This doesn't matter as much as you thought it did, really. I mean, there are things definitely that matter. There are things that are definitely important. But you have to save 
the energy that you have for the things that are really important. I feel like the next generation may have some more priorities that I didn't have to worry about at their age. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now that are kind of scary from a historical perspective. Uh, and I think that those younger people are going to have to really get involved with things that I didn't have to worry about so much in politics and stuff in order to prevent bad things from happening or rehappening, I should say. Because there's a lot of crazy people doing a lot of crazy things. It's going to definitely take a lot of young voices to, not just voices, but action. Like they need to like get off the internet and start doing real things. Like the activism on the internet is not really that real. You need to physically go places and do things, unfortunately. As a creative, I hope that they they learn to tell their stories authentically and that they don't give up, even in the face of difficulties and tribulations. They're tests. You just got to get through them. I would encourage them uh, to encourage others, to inspire others. I've always kind of felt like you got to kind of walk the walk and talk, if you're going to talk the talk. Like... It's easy for people to see people who just talk the talk as hollow. You have to walk the walk. You have to show other people you are willing to stand behind what it is that you believe in and what you say you believe in. And I don't mean in a, I'm going to get on my Twitter soapbox here and rant and ruin people's lives on account of things that I believe that are half-truths, maybe, because I'm sorry, but people lie on the internet. Um, people lie on the real life. And that is something that I, I feel like you know, some people forget they, they want to believe that people are honest, but people are complicated. They're not going to uh, be able to always uh, know what is truth and what is false until they actually get out there, meet those people and fact find. Like, be curious, be skeptical. Don't necessarily set your uh, beliefs like you know, kind of necessarily like all, it's like some of your fundamentals obviously should be pretty solid, but, you know, when it comes to being swayed by words and, and things like conspiracy theories and whatever, I feel like younger people are, can see through that better. And I think they just have better media literacy maybe than their forebears, like their parents and stuff. Like, unfortunately, those people my age, but I mean, I've lived on the internet since it existed. So I think I've got a little bit more savvy than most people my age. But, you know, like I, I, like I said, I have nieces and they're, uh, they're between the ages of 12 and 18. I want to make sure that they know how to be critically, how to critically think through things when they're making decisions and they're interacting with peers that they are going to be critical and, and curious about things. Like, don't just necessarily believe what they say at face value. Make sure that they've either done the research or been there when they're actually trying to fight for things that they believe in. There's so much work to do. And I don't envy the next generation having to do that work. I don't think that mine uh, is doing a great job right now. <laughs> and I think that they see more clearly a lot of the issues at hand in like they, I, I, and younger people just have a lot of, um, I don't know, it's so much as innocence and compassion, but they can be incredibly cruel, but they can also be incredibly compassionate, uh, young people. But I think that's just uh, a lack of, lack of experience and i'm sure the pandemic really didn't help with them growing up in terms of especially real life experience they're learning things a little later than they should have in terms of how to deal with people for realsies in real life and they feel nervous and they feel and i, I think that people need to be bold i've always believed that fortune favors the bold and that you have to put yourself out there even if it hurts even if it's scary even if it's uh, even if you're uncertain, even if there's a will, there's a way you will find it as long as you want it bad enough. If you don't want it bad enough, you're not going to see it through and you're not going to get what you want. If there's a will, there's a way has been my con mantra for years now. I, I, that was actually one of my, my mom's favorite saying, you know, she passed away in uh, 2018. But uh, she always said if there was a will, there was a way. And she was right. If you believe in it, and you are staunch and you stay with it and you keep pushing and you go with it you you can find the people who will help you and that's the other thing too is you're not an island you can't do everything by yourself you need other people uh life is a team sport it's not a solo player game you're going to be miserable if you try to play it that way that was something that was a hard lesson for me especially as an autistic individual i could not get where i am now without the people in my life and without having put myself out there 
even in uncomfortable situations in ways that I wasn't good at, to be honest with you, but I had to learn. I had to learn to be socializing and making friends and stuff and all of that didn't always come naturally to me. I had to learn. You can learn if you want to. You have to want it. And yes, you're going to suck at it. You have to kind of get past the suck. And that's kind of true with any skill, really. We don't start off 100% perfect every time. There, no. There's no way. We have Everybody, to right everybody's going to have their strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And you can shore up your weaknesses by practice. And then you can rely on other people to help you get past the things that you might not be good at. I'm not good at, at tech stuff. When we do our theming for the cons, for example, there are engineers on that team. Full-blown electrical and mechanical and robotics engineers. Like, doctors and shit. That's crazy. I can't do that stuff, but I have people who can. And that's the other thing is like, I got involved in volunteering to meet people. I need to do something in order to socialize with people. I'm not good in just a social situation where I'm just like, you know, wallflowering away. Parties are not, are not my jam. Like I don't do well at parties unless I know people there and I can go and float around and talk to the people I know. Yeah. And usually I'm talking about work. I like to work with people and that's how I make connections. I found that out about myself. I'm not saying that it's the same for other people, but you got to find the thing that works for you. And just because one thing doesn't work for you doesn't mean something else isn't going to work for you. So you got to try all kinds of things. And that's another thing is just try all the things, you know, just try it. It might suck, but you know, maybe you'll find out that, you know, maybe it doesn't suck as much as you thought. If your life was a comic book or an anime, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh boy. <laughs> That's a fun one. Um, what would my, my, I would probably be an anime, probably a slice of life anime. Uh, there would probably be a, a, a combination of house techno and lo-fi because uh, those are what I, I tend to listen to the most when I'm drawing and stuff. It, I mean, to be fair, I, I have a very eclectic musical taste. There are times when, uh, you know, like my life is, uh, is definitely more like hardcore metal than it is, you know, like the, the house techno I prefer it to be like, or the, the lo-fi when I want to chill. I think it would be an interesting soundtrack, to be fair. Uh, I don't know what the title would be. Uh, Life and Life and Times of a, of a Country Girl or something like that. I, I, I grew up in a log cabin in the middle of the Canadian woods, like it's not, or Canadian girl, I mean, it's Life, Life and Times of a Canadian Girl. Or, uh, you know, crazy, crazy cat lady or something, because, you know, I've got cats and I've loved cats and cats are one of my, you know, special yeah. interests. Well, Marie, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular cat, cat cat content. Uh, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much and Max for coming on the show. Hey, Max. Ooh. And uh, thank you very much for having us. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where can we find you online on this wonderful world of the internet and anything like that? Well, I am all over the place. Well, you can definitely find me on uh, shiftersonline.com. Uh, you can uh, tweet me at, uh, at shadowsmist. I am also on, uh, I'm on Mastodon. I'm on Facebook. Uh, also shadowsmist, uh, which is uh, A-S-H-A-D-O-W-S-M-Y-S-T. Um, I am on Twitch uh, as uh, shadows. Uh, underscore missed. Unfortunately, somebody stole my name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am also on. Um, I also have uh, Brimstone, which is uh, brimstone.net, which is still unfortunately on solar site. So it's a little slow. Bear with it. Um, I'm also found on DeviantArt as Shadows Mist. I can be found on Fur Affinity as Shadows Mist. Really just look up Shadows Mist and you'll probably find me on the first page of Google. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to support me, um, I have a Kofi and I have a Patreon. Uh, so if you want to give me a tip uh, or buy me a coffee so that I can be properly caffeinated in order to uh, do all the things that I do, Kofi is great. Um, if you want to support me a little more long term, you want to get early updates, uh, you want to, you know, get stream notifications, things like that. Uh, Patreon is definitely one you want to check out. Again, Patreon is uh, slash Shadows Mist. So it's all, all Shadows Mist all the time. 
Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You could, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, it's probably closer to 1,200 by now. I've lost count. And that's at tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. The web website is being revamped. So go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years because of reasons, which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com. Or search for Two Geeks Talking, the word two, not the number two, on any of your favorite streaming services like iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and tons of others. And support us, like us, share us, download us, send a comment, you know, follow these amazing creative people that we've had for the past 15 years. And as I say, every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.